This Alien Planet is brought to you by Campfire. Campfire is an online writing and world-building application designed to help you plan out and organize all the details of your projects in one place. Campfire Write includes 17 different modules that each handle different aspects of your project, including characters, locations, species, languages, magic systems, and more. All of these modules have a free version, but for the ones that you specifically need for your project, you can get the full version for as low as 25 cents a month. Or, if you prefer, you can unlock everything with a one-time purchase. You can choose to keep your work private, or to collaborate with other users and share your project on the Explore page to start building an audience of your own. And on the Learn page, you can find tutorials and guidance on all sorts of world-building and storytelling topics. Plus, there's a mobile app in development that'll be ready for release in the next few weeks. To sign up for Campfire, or to learn more, check out the link in the description. Over the past few episodes, the allopatric separation of the eastern and western continents has resulted in both developing their own distinct biota, or unique collection of native species. But after they reach their maximum degree of separation, the continents will begin slowly drifting back towards each other until they finally rejoin, setting the stage for ecological chaos. Biotic interchange occurs when two or more biotas that had previously been allopatrically separated come into contact with each other, such that species from either biota migrate into each other's habitat. The immediate effect of this is that species that have evolved for equivalent niches in their respective biotas will now be brought into competition with each other, usually resulting in extinction for whichever one happens to be less well adapted, causing a substantial restructuring of the biotas in only a few million years. The longer the biotas have been separated from each other before the interchange, the more time they'll have had to diverge from each other, and therefore the more dramatic the effects of the interchange will be. One of the most profound interchange events in the history of life on Earth was the Great American Interchange, when North and South America, which had been separated since the age of the dinosaurs, collided with each other about three million years ago, allowing species to migrate across the Isthmus of Panama, resulting in huge changes to the biotas of both continents. Curiously though, the interchange had a much greater effect on the South American biota than the North American one, with the majority of the native South American megafauna being rapidly outcompeted and driven to extinction by their North American competitors. So that today, about half of all South American mammals descend from North American ancestors. Interchange events often show this sort of asymmetry, where one biota finds greater success and largely supplants the other, which are therefore sometimes called the donator and recipient biotas respectively. The approach of the two continents on our alien planet will likewise result in biotic interchange on a continental scale, turning the interface of the two continents into an evolutionary battleground. The exact outcome of such a large-scale event is difficult to predict, but there are a number of ecological factors that may influence how things play out. Possibly the greatest predictor of the outcome of interchange events is land area. The larger a habitat is, the more resources it will offer and the greater diversity it will support, and the more competitive its native species will be. This is one reason why island ecosystems are at such risk from invasive species from the mainland, while island-dwelling species rarely pose similar threats if they spread to other land masses. The island of Isla Proxima formed at the end of the Ice Age as a result of rising sea levels, but in the tens of millions of years that follow, tectonic uplift and changing coastlines will eventually reconnect the island with the eastern continent, resulting in interchange with the mainland clays. During its isolation, Isla Proxima's small size and limited food resulted in the death of the dominant clades of large herbivores and predators, creating a relatively uncompetitive ecosystem where smaller clades thrived. But when the island rejoins the mainland, the native herbivores, like the nanopods, won't be able to compete with their larger relatives, and the predatory teratochirids and romaliopods aren't as well equipped as the onychodonts to tackle large prey, and so virtually all of Isla Proxima's native fauna will be swiftly driven to extinction. Even on a continental scale, the more successful biota during interchange events is usually the one from the larger landmass. While North and South America are of roughly similar sizes, 
North America has been periodically connected to Eurasia, and by extension Africa, throughout its history, meaning its biota was representative of a more or less global area, while South America had been completely isolated for tens of millions of years by the time the interchange took place. Even species that rafted to South America from Africa, like the ancestors of New World monkeys and caviomorph rodents, were still able to compete effectively with the South American biota, and have since become highly successful and diverse groups, with some even managing to spread into North America. Though the western continent is the slightly larger of the two, both are still roughly comparable in size, so any competitive advantage its biota gains from land area alone may only be very minor, but the outcome of the interchange may also be influenced by the climate. In the American interchange, South America's warm tropical conditions made it relatively easy for North American clades to migrate south, while South American clades moving northward were impeded by drier habitats that they had no adaptations for coping with. On our alien planet, the eastern continent has remained centred on tropical latitudes throughout its existence, and so much of the landscape has enjoyed a warm, stable climate, while the western continent has seen much greater climatic variation. As well as experiencing a huge faunal turnover as a result of the Ice Age, the continent's great latitudinal breadth allows it to support a wide range of biomes, from tundra and cold deserts in the north, to temperate forests and plains, to large coastal rainforests at the equator, and expanses of hot deserts further inland. This means the western species will have little difficulty in adapting to the fertile plains and forests of the eastern continent, while any eastern species migrating westward will quickly arrive in biomes that are less hospitable than those they evolved in. This asymmetric migration may mean that the western species will comprise the donator biota and the eastern clades will serve as the recipient biota. The first stage of the interchange will begin before the continents even join. As they approach each other, the diminishing distance between them will make rafting events more feasible. As early as four million years before the Isthmus of Panama formed, a species of North American procyonid managed to raft across the Central American Seaway and establish a radiation of South American forms, even giving rise to large predators like the bear-sized Chapel Melania. Likewise, the first contact between our two continents will be clays that are small enough to raft across the narrowing seaway, like malacaforms, small diplostomes, and some of the basal platodonts. But when a land bridge finally forms, it won't be long before megafauna make their way across among the first of which will be large herbivores seeking new feeding grounds. Since the Ice Age, the most successful group of large herbivores on the western continent have been the Alabrachids, of which at least one clade living in the southern areas near the land bridge may move into the eastern plains, where they'll now enter competition with the Camptopods and other eastern Leptopods. Although the outcome of this competition may not be as one-sided as what occurred during the American Interchange, the Alabrachids do have several key advantages over the Camptopods. Their centaurism gives them more efficient locomotion and greater speed, and allows them to use their front limbs to forage for food, and their fur makes their thermoregulation more efficient, letting them sustain longer periods of high activity and allowing them to survive in a greater range of climates, which is a big reason why they were able to fill the niches of older herbivores during the Ice Age. But one of their biggest advantages pertains to their reproduction, being thylacopods, female alabrachids use their pouch-like gonopods to cradle their developing oophyca, giving them a much higher rate of juvenile survival than most other osteopod clades. With this pre-hatching parental care, these animals have specialized for case selection, which provides the greatest benefit in ecosystems with high levels of competition and that are near carrying capacity. While some captopods may have evolved nest guarding behaviors and other basic forms of parental care, they don't have the same degree of caselected traits as the Alabrachids, who will therefore have a sizable edge in the highly competitive habitats at the interface of the two continents. This advantage will also be strengthened by their breeding system. All species that have a distinction between male and female sexes will have to contend with, say it with me now, Bateman's Principle, which states that males gain a greater benefit from having multiple mates than females do. It therefore seems logical for species to tend towards polygyny, which is indeed one of the most common breeding systems, but females do still get some benefits from mating with more than one male. For one thing, it means greater genetic variation among her offspring, 
increasing their chances of survival in variable and competitive environments and speeding up the rate of adaptation. After all, increased genetic diversity is one of the key advantages of sexual reproduction in the first place. Plus, in species in which the female is able to store the male's gametes, having multiple mates will give her a greater variety of gametes to choose from, and let her preferentially select gametes from the fittest males even after she's mated with them. Many of the captopods, such as the Sphenoceratons, have evolved polygynous mating systems like harems, which, since all the group's offspring share the same father, have fairly limited genetic diversity. While the looser structure of the alabracid herds and their lecking behaviours may lead to many species evolving polygenandry, in which both males and females have multiple mates within a single breeding season. This greater genetic diversity will complement their adaptations for case selection, which, along with their efficient locomotion and thermoregulation, will let them gain a foothold on the plains of the eastern continent, giving rise to a new clade of eastern alabracids that we'll call the Neobrachids. But as they establish themselves, some Neobrachids may also manage to move into the niches of larger herbivores. On the eastern continent, the Titanopods have held their position as the largest herbivores since they first evolved over a hundred million years ago, while on the western continent, the Ice Age killed off most Titanopod species outside the tropics, and even those that survive may struggle to maintain dominance once the Alabracids evolve. The Titanopods are bulky and slow, and have a very limited range of motion due to the rigid structure of their limb girdles. Most species have no defense against predators other than their size, and they have no ability to regulate their body temperature beyond relying on gigantothermy. In contrast, the Alabracids are much faster and more agile thanks to their cursorial adaptations, and are less sensitive to climate fluctuations and are able to maintain higher levels of activity thanks to their endothermy. This may mean that if some Neobrachids reach larger sizes, they'll be able to compete effectively enough to intrude upon the Titanopods' niches and establish a new clade of giant herbivores. Although their ancestors were covered in coarse hair, getting larger will mean they'll generate more body heat, so they won't need any specialized integument to keep them warm, and so reduce their covering of fur in much the same way as large mammals like elephants and rhinos, retaining only a large mane used for display and social signaling. In fact, the warm tropical climate of the eastern gallery forests may present a risk of overheating, which they may counter by increasing their surface area, evolving a crest or dewlap on the underside of their cephalothorax to radiate away any excess heat. Growing larger will also have implications for their reproduction. The number of offspring a species produces in a single reproductive event will be contingent on various ecological factors, but a decent rule of thumb is lax principle which states that a species' average clutch size will be roughly equal to the maximum number of young the parents are able to provide adequate resources for. Larger animals take a longer time to develop and require more resources to grow, both before and after birth, and therefore their young represent a greater reproductive investment, which is one reason why large body sizes are correlated with case selection and reduced clutch sizes. However, for animals that produce live young, Larger offspring require longer gestation periods and more resources during their development, and so the animal will only be able to grow so large before reproduction becomes too great a burden on the mother to be practical, meaning viviparous animals tend to have a lower limit on their maximum size than egg-laying ones. Although the alabracids don't give birth to live young, growing bigger will necessarily involve producing larger oothecae, but their gonopods can only hold so much weight, so above a certain size, they'll have to abandon the ancestral thalacopod condition of carrying their young around with them, and will instead need to make nests and guard the oothecae until they hatch. Being herding animals, they'll congregate at communal nesting sites where they can lay their eggs in relative safety. Along with the other neobrachids, the evolution of these large herbivores, which we'll call phalacrobrachids, will force many of the eastern herbivores into decline. Most of the larger species of camptopods and other eastern leptopods whose adaptations put them in direct competition with the neobrachids will likely die out within a few million years, leaving only the smaller, more adaptable species that are still able to find niches, while the only advantage the titanopods have over the phalacrobrachids is their sheer size, so only a handful of exceptionally large species like the stylopods may survive, feeding on foliage out of even the phalacrobrachids' reach. 
But worse still, as the Alabracids cross the land bridge, they'll be followed by the Enzodonts and the other western Onychodont clades, which will present an entirely new source of predation against which the eastern herbivores will have had no way of preparing for, leading to the extinction of yet more species. However, the predatory niches here are already occupied by other Onychodonts like the Cryptodonts, once again sparking competition between the two clades. The key difference between these Onychodont groups is in their weaponry. The Enzodont's robust, pincer-like pedipalps make them much better suited than the Cryptodonts to bringing down large prey, so the Enzodonts may be able to quickly outcompete most of the macropredatory Cryptodonts and assume the niches of top predators. However, the Cryptodonts still have the advantage in catching small, fast prey thanks to their gracile bodies and mantis-like raptorial forelimbs, which may allow some species to differentiate their niches enough from the Enzodonts to not be entirely outcompeted. These relatively small, fast Cryptodonts, which we'll call Tachodonts, will be among the relatively few Eastern clades that are lucky enough to be pre-adapted to the pressures brought on by the interchange possibly even managing to spread westward across the land bridge. For although the donator biota has the overall competitive advantage, the recipient biota may still have members that survive or even profit from the interchange. One of the few clades of native South American mammals that survive to the present day are the Xenothrans, the sloths, anteaters, and armadillos, which seem to have been lucky enough to have just the right combination of traits that made them more resistant to the northern invaders than other South American clades. In fact, they proved to be so successful that they were one of the few South American clades to spread into North America. One adaptation that contributed to their success was having suitable defenses against the influx of new predators, particularly in the case of the Cingulates, the group of Xenothrans that includes armadillos and the extinct Glyptodonts which were some of the only mammals to ever invest in armor. There's even evidence that some Glyptodonts evolved heavier and spikier armor as the interchange took place in response to increased predation. This being the case, the eastern clades with sufficient adaptations against predators may be some of the most likely to survive. With their banded shell and venomous spines, the Pronocanthids are some of the most well defended of the eastern clades, so they may fare well during the interchange and among them, the protection the Phylactocanthids provide to their hoplopod symbionts may help them survive as well. An armoured shell is also an ancestral trait among the Plecostracans, and in the areas into which the western predators spread, those with the most impenetrable shells will be selected for. In the several million years after the land bridge forms, some of these Plecostracans will evolve rows of spikes along their shells to further repel attackers, as well as extra armour around their vulnerable head and legs. We'll call these most heavily defended of Plecostracans the Echinostracans. The only predators who have a decent chance of getting through the Echinostracans' defenses are the Maliagnathans, who've specialized for deurophagy by evolving some of the strongest bite forces of any osteopods to crack open bones and other inedible parts of carcasses. By adapting their jaws for breaking open the Echinostracan shells, they'll have access to a food source that almost no other predator can compete for. But this feeding behavior won't be immune to exploitation. Kleptoparasitism is a behavior in which an organism steals food that another animal has already gathered or caught, which saves the kleptoparasite the time and effort of collecting its own food. While many animals will steal food if given the chance, some species specialize for it to the extent that kleptoparasitism accounts for a significant part of their diet. The most frequent targets of kleptoparasitism are species that are adapted to exploit food sources that are largely inaccessible to other animals, such as oyster catchers that crack open the shells of bivalves or diving birds that bring underwater prey to the surface, both of which are often mobbed by other birds once they've obtained their prey. The Maliagnathans will be similarly vulnerable to kleptoparasitism from other predators, who will try to steal the echinostracan corpses from them after they've already done the work of breaking open their shells. Possibly the most likely source of this kleptoparasitism will be from other Maliagnathans. Emery's rule states that kleptoparasites and other social parasites tend to be closely related to the species they parasitize, although there are plenty of exceptions to this. This rule results from the fact that kleptoparasitism is most often an intraspecific interaction, where one animal steals food from another member of the same species, there will always be some degree of variation in any species, 
and therefore some individuals will naturally be able to gather food more effectively than others. So those with less adaptive traits may compensate for their disadvantage by stealing food from their competitors. And if this proves to be a successful strategy, the descendants of these individuals may ultimately branch off as a new species of specialist kleptoparasite. If this occurs in the Maliagnathans, the resulting clade may undergo physical adaptations for their new kleptoparasitic lifestyle. Since they no longer have to crunch through hard shells, their jaws will become weaker and less robust, but they'll also reach larger sizes than other Maliagnathans to more easily bully them out of their kills. On account of these feeding behaviours, we'll call them Lestignathans. Meanwhile, some clades may find other ways to defend themselves against the western predators. The Kentrodonts are equipped with venom, which serves not only as a defence mechanism, but also as a weapon in hunting, letting them take down prey much larger than most other predators of their size. In the rainforest along the eastern coast, the Kentrodonts have given rise to forms like the Aspodonts that specialise in catching flying animals, and the Phylophorans that feed on nectarivores, but other, more generalist Kentrodonts exist in forests all across the continent, and with their impressive armament, they may be able to compete for niches throughout the fringe of jungle along the northern coast of the land bridge. Their venom already gives them an edge over their western competitors, but the increased evolutionary pressure from moving into new ecosystems may result in them acquiring new adaptations. All Lophostomes have a pair of eye stalks, each tipped with three eyes, in most species, these eyes are quite weak, and are better at sensing motion than resolving clear images, so some groups may compensate for their poor vision with other senses. While thermoreception, the ability to sense temperature, is ubiquitous among animals on Earth, a handful of clades have the ability to process infrared thermal radiation using the same region of the brain dedicated to vision, allowing them to effectively see heat in the same way they see visible light. This ability has evolved twice among snakes, which allows them to detect the body heat of prey and to find areas of suitable warmth, as well as in vampire bats, which are able to sense blood-rich hotspots on their host's body, and Melanophila beetles use their infrared sensing to detect forest fires, as their larvae are only adapted to feeding on freshly burnt wood. If a clade of Kentrodonts were to evolve infrared sensing, it would not only help them hunt in low light, but it will be particularly beneficial when it comes to sensing endothermic animals, as endothermy inherently produces more body heat than ectothermy, allowing these kentrodonts to more easily target prey like the opisthopterans and pleuropterans, and to avoid larger predators like the onychodonts. On Earth, virtually all clays capable of sensing infrared have convergently evolved pit-shaped receptors, which are riddled with blood vessels for rapid heat exchange and contain nerve endings that carry the signals they detect to the visual centres of the brain. These kentrodonts may evolve similar receptors from the remnants of the sensory setae on their eye stalks, becoming vascularised pits around the eyes that transmit the signals to the optic lobes. But while these kentrodonts, which we'll call tropophorans, will rely on their senses and weaponry to survive, other Kentrodonts may instead adapt by developing new life history strategies. Once again, highly competitive ecosystems like those at the centre of the interchange tend to favour case selection, so another clade of Kentrodonts may increase their juvenile survival rates by evolving one particular reproductive behaviour. While most parasites will depend entirely on their host throughout their whole lives, Parasitoids only spend part of their life cycle attached to their host before eventually killing it once they're developed enough to survive independently. On Earth, parasitoidy occurs in as much as 10% of all insect species, among which it's evolved dozens of times, and usually involves the animal laying its eggs on or within a host to serve as a living incubator for their larvae, which then feed on and kill the host once they hatch. One clade of Kentrodonts may begin the transition to parasitoidy by evolving to deliver their eggs onto the corpse of freshly killed prey to provide them with a first meal upon hatching. But by evolving venom that only paralyzes the target rather than outright killing it, the host won't decompose in the time it takes for the young to develop. Only once the young hatch do they kill and eat the host, a behavior by which these Kentrodonts will qualify as full-fledged parasitoids. Like most other parasites, Parasitoids are usually highly host-specific, most often co-evolving with a particular host clade or even a single species. 
Some of the most abundant animals that these parasitoid chentrodonts share the treetops with are the scandopods, which represent one of the earliest radiations of fully arboreal osteopods, and have since undergone considerable diversification, now being a common sight in forests across the planet. Being so prolific, they'll be a food source for many arboreal predators, but for these chentrodonts, they'll also serve as ideal hosts. Just as true parasites may be either ectoparasitic or endoparasitic, parasitoids may be either ectoparasitoid, attaching their eggs to the outside of the host, or endoparasitoid, laying their eggs within the host's body. The basal members of these parasitoid chentrodonts will be ectoparasitoids, simply attaching the eggs to the host's exterior and injecting it with paralytic venom to ensure that it doesn't damage or dislodge the eggs. Parasitoids that prevent the movement or development of their hosts in this way are called idiobionts, almost all of which are ectoparasitoids. However, the eggs of endoparasitoids will be protected within the host's body, so immobilizing it becomes unnecessary, and therefore the majority of endoparasitoids are coinobiont, allowing the host to continue movement and growth while the eggs develop inside it. While the earliest members of these chentrodonts will be ectoparasitoid idiobionts, becoming coinobionts may help some species achieve a wider dispersal, as their still moving hosts will help transport the developing young to new areas. As all lophostomes have their reproductive glands located within their mouth, these chentrodonts may evolve an oral ovipositor with which they can inject the eggs into the host's body. Without the need to paralyze the host, they may evolve weaker venom or even lose their venom entirely, becoming coinobionts in so doing. Like many parasitoid clades on Earth, these chentrodonts, which we'll call dinoglossids, may see the transition between ecto- and endoparasitoidy occur multiple times, each species co-evolving with its own unique host species of scandopod or other small platodont. But the animals with the greatest odds of surviving the interchange will be small generalists, as the more survival strategies are available to a species, the easier it will be for them to undergo niche partitioning to avoid competition. While the marsupials and other metatherians were once widespread throughout South America, one of the only clades to survive the Great American Interchange were the opossums, which were generalist enough to cope with the increased competition, with one species, the Virginia opossum, being the only marsupial species to spread into North America. Among the eastern clades, the pipiodonts are adaptable enough to feed on whatever they can find at ground level, and their social system lets them more effectively gather food and evade predators than other opisthopterans, so they may have some of the greatest success in migrating westward. They'll be accompanied by various other lophostome species, as well as many scandopods and other basal platodonts, but the western biota will have generalists of its own. As adaptable mesocarnivores that have evolved to thrive in inhospitable and competitive habitats, the xenopsids will be more than tenacious enough to cross the land bridge. A large part of the Xenopsid's success is owed to their feeding arrangement. While the pedipalps do the work of shearing off and cutting up chunks of food, the mandibles bear broad, flat teeth to further grind down the food before it's swallowed, letting them tackle almost any food source they come across. In some species, the mandibles may become partially internalized so as to not get in the way of the pedipalps, which will move forward to more easily close over and restrain prey. The other major factor leading to their success is their social structure. Their pack hunting behaviors let them compete against larger predators in regions where prey is scarce or difficult to hunt, and their cooperative breeding ensures a high rate of survival among their offspring. As we discussed in the last episode, cooperative breeding is closely associated with monogamy, which maximizes relatedness among the group members' offspring to let them gain the maximum possible inclusive fitness from helping in one another's reproduction. However, as mentioned earlier, having multiple mates increases the offspring's genetic diversity, which strengthens their chances of survival. This trade-off means that even species that exhibit cooperative breeding may still occasionally seek additional mates. In the Xenopsids, this may be influenced by their dominance hierarchy, in which females have greater access to food and mating opportunities than males do. This may lead to some species exhibiting polyandry, a mating system in which females have multiple mates, while males each mate with only a single female. Polyandry is one of the least common mating systems, as it's the opposite of what would be expected from Bateman's principle. 
but there are some rare ecological circumstances under which it may be favoured. One benefit is that the female will be able to distribute the duties of parental care among her mates. In fact, almost all of the very few bird species that exhibit male-only parental care are polyandrous. In sequential or serial polyandry, the female will abandon the male after laying the eggs and begin looking for a new mate. But if the female is capable of producing more offspring than a single male could feasibly care for, this may lead to simultaneous polyandry, in which the female maintains nests with multiple males at the same time. In especially rare cases, this can manifest as cooperative polyandry, in which all the males that a female mates with will remain with her at a single nest and all work together to raise the young. Since the offspring don't share the same father, the males don't gain the same degree of inclusive fitness as they would from monogamous forms of cooperative breeding, but working together may still provide a greater chance of any given male's young surviving than each male raising their young individually. Polyandry is also associated with more intense mate competition among females, which often results in a reversal of the typical pattern of sexual selection seen in other mating systems. Polyandrous females tend to show sexually dimorphic traits like larger body sizes and brighter coloration, while the males are often comparatively small and drab. The females and opsids are already larger than the males, and in the polyandrous species they may also develop markings around their faces and forearms to attract additional mates. It's important to note that relatively few species will be restricted to a single mating system, and that many species will alternate between different mating systems depending on the availability of mates and other resources in their habitat. Likewise, these xenopsids, which we'll call stenopsids, will vary their mating system to suit whatever ecological situation they find themselves in. The need to balance relatedness with genetic diversity leads to flexibility in mating systems among many forms of cooperative breeding. Although monogamy is an unavoidable prerequisite for the evolution of eusociality, many eusocial species show a surprising versatility in their mating systems, some species of bees and ants having among the highest rates of polyandry of all animals. This will apply to clays like the ramphodonts as well, as although their helpers gain maximum inclusive fitness from monogamy, the breeding female may still take the opportunity to mate with any wandering males that visit her burrow to replenish or supplement her supply of gametes. As small, hardy generalists, some ramphodont species may also be able to spread eastward, giving rise to new clades along the way. While the Erycticyrids have become completely adapted for a fossorial existence, and thus have no need for large, complex eyes in their lightless tunnels, the basal ramphodonts still spend a significant portion of their time out of their burrows, especially when foraging at night, and so they'll retain enlarged anterior eyes equipped with a tapetum lucidum and an external membrane that fills the function of both an eyelid and an iris. In some species, these eyes may be complemented by special orbital muscles that let them swivel within their sockets to scan their surroundings for danger. As their forelimbs become increasingly specialized for digging and handling food, they'll become less efficient in locomotion, which may result in some species undergoing centaurism, capable of holding their digging claws off the ground. But once again, the greatest component of their success lies in their reproductive behaviors. One of the major benefits of cooperative breeding is that all of the members of the social group working together will be able to provide more care for the collective offspring, which, as described by Lack's principle, will make it feasible for them to produce more offspring at a time. To leverage this advantage, they'll benefit from adaptations that allow them to care for the young as efficiently as possible. One way of doing this is to provide the newly born young with a special form of nourishment that's easier for them to feed on. The most obvious example of this is the milk produced by female mammals, but similar adaptations are found in many other clades. Some birds, like pigeons, emperor penguins, and flamingos, have independently evolved crop milk a special secretion produced in the throat that they regurgitate for their hatchlings. And in addition to milk, female koalas even produce a unique form of fecal matter called pap, which the young feed on before they develop the complex guts they need to feed on plant matter directly. Similarly, for the first few months of their lives, the ramphodonts don't have sufficiently developed digestive systems to tackle most food sources, so when the helpers provide their younger siblings with food, they'll pre-chew it and partially digest it before regurgitating it. This may even lead to the evolution of a cecum, 
or specialized offshoot of the foregut for storing food, containing glands that produce enzymes that turn the food into an edible paste. Since the role of caring for the young is carried out entirely by the helpers, any helpers that inherit breeding status will gradually lose these organs as they mature. But while increasing the efficiency of their parental care may help these ramphodonts, which we'll call acrochirids, to survive in the competitive habitat created by the interchange, these behaviours will once again be open to exploitation. Brood parasites lay their eggs in the nests of other animals, who then mistake the brood parasites young for their own and provide care for them. Some of the most well-known brood parasites are cuckoos, but similar behaviours have independently evolved in dozens of other clades. Like kleptoparasitism, brood parasitism often, though not always, follows the pattern of Emery's rule, beginning as an intraspecific interaction from which the brood parasites eventually branch off as a new species. The Ramphodonts first evolved helpers at the nest in response to the high cost of dispersal in the barren deserts and valleys of the western continent. But if they spread into richer habitats, where cooperative breeding no longer returns greater fitness than breeding individually, they may abandon sociality and revert to being solitary, as has happened in many social species on Earth. Indeed, habitats that can accommodate larger populations will provide more opportunities for a female to deposit her eggs into a nearby nest, which explains why brood parasitism is most common in species that nest colonially or that live at high population densities. In the ramphodonts that spread into the lush eastern plains, brood parasitism may provide wandering females with additional opportunities for reproduction if they can't find suitable spots to dig their own burrows, instead sneaking into another ramphodont's burrow and depositing their young while the resident helpers are distracted or away gathering food. For the first few months of their lives, one female's grubs look much the same as another's, so the helpers may not even realize the nest has been infiltrated and will provide care for the new young alongside the others. In most cases, brood parasitism will be a facultative behaviour, only serving as an optional strategy alongside more typical reproductive behaviours. But if it proves successful enough, it may evolve into obligate brood parasitism, the species becoming so specialised that it loses the ability to look after its own young entirely, and can only reproduce through parasitizing other nests. One major benefit of this is that, without any need to provide any parental care, the brood parasite will be free to hugely increase its clutch size, which will also let them parasitize more nests to give them more chances for successful reproduction. Having a brood parasite's young in their nest is obviously a detriment to the host, as they won't gain any fitness from wasting time and energy to care for the young of an unrelated animal. Plus, brood parasites tend to have young that are larger and that grow faster than the host species so that they're able to more easily outcompete their nest mates, and many also kill the host's young so that they receive a greater proportion of care. The hatchlings of greater honey guides have sharp tips on their beaks with which they attack and kill their step-siblings, and newly hatched cuckoos engage in what's called egg tossing, pushing the eggs around them out of the nest. This puts a pressure on the hosts to recognize and kill any brood parasites young they find in their nest, though they do so at the risk of accidentally killing their own young. Some brood parasites respond to this by evolving eggs that mimic the appearance of the host's eggs, while others produce larger eggs with thicker shells to make it harder for the hosts to break them or push them out of the nest, and many also remove some of the host's eggs after depositing their own so as to not alter the size of the clutch which might otherwise alert the hosts that the nest has been tampered with. These parasitic ramphodonts may evolve to mimic their host's helpers so that they're less likely to be recognized as an intruder, and will produce grubs that are much larger than those of other ramphodonts, and that are equipped with sharp, pointed teeth from birth. Even in their incredibly altricial juvenile stage, the parasitic grubs will kill the other young around them, and as soon as they're developed enough to survive on their own, they'll abandon the burrow and begin looking for a mate. We'll call them Apatochirids. Over the course of the interchange, small, adaptable clades like these will find the most success, while the more specialized forms, particularly the eastern megafauna, may struggle and begin to die out. But the original eastern biota may be spared from total extinction thanks to a lucky geological event. Just as the land bridge begins forming, a chunk of the eastern continent will break off and drift northward to become an island continent that we'll call Septentria. 
This landmass will serve as a refugium for many clades that go extinct on the mainland, including all the varieties of camptopods and other leptopods, as well as the macropredatory cryptodonts and other eastern onychodont species. But the majority of Septentria's diversity will be comprised by the clades that inhabited the eastern rainforest, of which Septentria originally formed a part of, and once allopatry occurs between Septentria and the new supercontinent, all of the resident clades will begin to diverge from their mainland relatives. One major difficulty for plants growing in the Septentrian rainforests will be obtaining nutrients. As mentioned in Part 9, the high rainfall in rainforests leaches a large portion of the minerals out of the soil, and epiphytes growing along the trunks of larger plants don't have access to the soil at all, so many plants are forced to adopt other modes of nutrition. One option is to steal nutrients from other plants. Parasitism is very common among plants on Earth, having evolved well over a dozen times. Some parasitic plants are hemiparasites, still gaining some portion of their energy through photosynthesis. But if parasitism proves to be a more effective way of obtaining energy than sunlight, like for example in the dark understory of the rainforest, they may evolve into holoparasites, gaining all of their nutrition from parasitism and losing the ability to photosynthesize entirely. The key adaptation that all parasitic plants have in common are haustoria, or specialized roots that can penetrate the tissues of host plants and absorb nutrients from them. Many plant clades on our alien planet are likely to have parasitic representatives as well. Some of the epiphytic chromatophytes will make up for the lack of soil on the branches they grow along by evolving haustoria that penetrate the vascular tissues of their host trees and steal their nutrients. This, along with the fact that light is so limited below the canopy, means that it may no longer be worth investing energy into growing leaves, so they may end up transitioning to hollow parasitism by losing their leaves entirely, for which reason we'll call them aphylophytes. Another option for plants living in nutrient-poor environments is to take up energy from animals. Carnivory has independently evolved at least a dozen times in plants on Earth most often in species living in rainforests or in wetlands with poor quality soil. However, definitions vary as to what qualifies a plant as being truly carnivorous. Some fall into the nebulous category of protoconivorous plants, which have the ability to absorb nutrients from animals indirectly, such as dew sticks and Lowe's pitcher plant, which collect and feed on the droppings of animals that visit them. However, under most definitions, true carnivorous plants have adaptations for both killing prey and using their nutrients to grow. Although carnivory has evolved in so many different plant clades, most have converged on a handful of common mechanisms for catching prey. Passive traps are those that don't rely on movement, of which pitfall traps are one of the most common forms, having evolved in at least six different groups in which prey, lured by nectar, fall into a deep fluid-filled chamber, while lobster pot traps are lined with backward-pointing setae that force the prey to keep moving forward until they reach a stomach-like chamber where they're digested, while flypaper traps, in which prey becomes stuck within a glue-like substance along the plant's surface, have evolved at least five times. While some flypaper traps are passive, they can also evolve into active traps, where the plant moves to envelop the prey to ensure that it can't escape. At least two species have adapted an ancestral flypaper trap into snap traps, where two opposing lobes rapidly press together, and bladder warts are unique in having evolved bladder traps, which, when triggered by passing prey, release an opening into a chamber containing a partial vacuum that sucks the prey inside. Unlike parasitic plants, though, no known species of carnivorous plant has lost the ability to photosynthesize, and all carnivorous plants still get some portion of their energy from sunlight, possibly because carnivory isn't a reliable enough source of nutrition for a plant to live on alone. The chromatophytes and zygophytes cover the surface of their gametangia with hair-like filaments, which are coated in a sticky, gamete-filled fluid that gets stuck along the bodies of pollinators who visit the plant. If any small animals, like malacaforms, become trapped in this fluid and are unable to pull themselves free, their decaying bodies will act as fertilizer to help the plant grow. This may serve as a basis for species living in the poor quality soil of the Septentrian rainforests to evolve passive flypaper traps, which in at least one clade of zygophyte may specialize into active traps. 
These traps will be derived from repurposed reproductive remits whose male gametangia evolve into elongated tentacle-like structures, and the filaments that cover them will no longer produce any gametes, but only a sticky mucilage. When small prey like malacaforms or pycopterans come to feed from the nectaries hidden within the filaments, they'll trigger vibration-sensitive setae that cause the tentacles to close over the prey and begin secreting enzymes to digest it, an adaptation that will earn them the name Harpactophytes. As well as leaching nutrients, the high rainfall in the rainforest also feeds enormous river systems and creates large expanses of wetland, which will be home to innumerable aquatic clades. In Part 7, we explored the major radiations of the acanthopods, the aquatic sister clade of the sarcopods. At various points throughout the last hundred million years, the acanthopods will have launched many independent invasions of freshwater habitats including one early radiation of hadrorachids that spreads into the coastal swamps and rainforest waterways. In the murky waters of such habitats, visibility is often limited, so many aquatic animals supplement their vision with some other sense. One clade may rely on mechanoreception, evolving their anterior feeding arms into a pair of antennae-like structures to help them feel their way along debris-strewn riverbeds. On account of these structures, we'll call this clade the Diplocirids. But mechanoreception has a very limited range, so some groups may evolve other means of sensing over longer distances. One fairly common option is electroreception, the ability to detect electrical signals such as those generated by the nervous systems of other animals. Electroreception is an ancestral trait in fish, among various clades of which it's been secondarily lost and re-evolved many times but it also occurs in some dolphins and even in monotremes like the platypus. It's important to note that, with the sole exception of echidnas, which use their fairly weak electric sense to probe for worms beneath the soil, all electroreceptive species are at least partially aquatic, which is simply due to the fact that water conducts electricity while air is an insulator. Much like infrared sensing, electroreceptive species on Earth have converged on a similar structure of fluid-filled pits, which these acanthopods may evolve from the vestigial setae along their bodies. Most electroreceptive species are only capable of passive electroreception, which simply involves detecting electrical activity from external sources, but at least six clades have evolved active electroreception, or electrogenesis, the ability to produce their own electric field around themselves and detect the distortions that occur as anything passes through it. This is accomplished using a special battery-like electric organ derived from modified muscles or nerves, which is usually located in the tail or along the length of the body. A handful of electrogenetic fish are even able to produce a strong enough discharge to stun nearby targets, which can be used both as a defense mechanism and as a weapon to kill prey. One clade of diplocirids may also evolve an electric organ within their tail, which will let them hunt prey within the sediment, as well as to sense incoming predators and to produce electrical discharges to deter them, an ability for which we'll call them astropophorans. But beyond their electrogenesis, these and other freshwater acanthopods may see an even more significant adaptation in their reproduction. In adapting to life on dry land, the osteopod's ancestors evolved internal fertilization, in which the male transfers his gametes into the female's body and the fertilized embryos are only birthed once they've developed a waterproof oatheca to stop them from desiccating in the open air. However, as there's no such risk of desiccation in the water, the aquatic acanthopods have been able to retain external fertilization, whereby the males and females simply release their gametes into the water, and the young develop entirely outside the mother. Without the burden of carrying the young, Reproduction will be significantly less costly for the female and allow her to mate more often, and as such, polyandry becomes a more viable option. On a related note, whichever sex experiences a greater burden during reproduction will be the one with the greater incentive to provide parental care. In internal fertilization, the burden of carrying the young all but guarantees that the female will perform most or all of the duties of parental care, whereas in species with external fertilization, there's a much lower discrepancy in reproductive cost between the sexes, so parental care is much more likely to involve the male. It's not surprising then that the vast majority of instances of male-only parental care occur in fish, amphibians, and other groups with external fertilization. 
This can lead to males evolving traits that would otherwise be associated with females. In seahorses and several related clades, the males have an abdominal brood pouch to incubate the fertilized eggs, a behavior sometimes termed male pregnancy. And in sea spiders, the male carries the bundles of eggs within a pair of specialized appendages called ovages. Likewise, any acanthopod species that evolves polyandry may also see the evolution of parental care behaviors among males. The males will defend territories in shallow streams and secluded pools, which will occasionally be visited by wandering females. The female will abandon the male and the fertilized eggs immediately after spawning in search of more mates, and the male will tend to the eggs and protect them until they hatch and disperse. The increased rates of juvenile survival afforded by these behaviors will help them persist in the face of the many predators they share the water with, including not only other acanthopods, but also various semi-aquatic clades. While by this point, most of the older varieties of Dinognathans will have been outcompeted by the faster, more specialized Onychodonts, the semi-aquatic clades like the Dolichognathans will survive in wetlands across the planet, and those that end up in the swamps of Septentria will enjoy lower levels of competition than the mainland. Like the Astropophorans, these Dolichognathans may adapt their senses for the murky water, but they may do so in a completely different way. Echolocation, or biosonar, involves emitting sound waves and detecting the echoes that bounce off any nearby objects. Like electroreception, echolocation can provide an advantage in environments where sight is limited, but unlike light, sound waves can only travel so far before they fade and become undetectable, meaning echolocation is inherently short-ranged, so echolocating species will still rely on sight as their primary sense and no known species has completely lost its vision in favor of echolocation. As mentioned in the last episode, an easy way for an animal with active respiration to produce a sound is to use the movement of air through the respiratory system. Dolphins and other echolocating cetaceans use the air flowing through their nasal passages to create a series of rapid clicks, the sound of which pass through the melon, an organ that acts like a sonic lens to focus the clicks into a unidirectional beam of sound which in many species is aided by a complex skull shape. A similar function is believed to be served by the nose leaf in echolocating bats. In these Dolichognathans, a portion of their respiratory passages will pass through a resonating chamber within the cephalothorax, which will amplify the sound and direct it forward so the animal can sense what's directly in front of it. These Dolichognathans, which we'll call Hypognathans, won't be as large or fearsome as their enormous marine relatives or their terrestrial ancestors, but they'll nonetheless thrive in their isolation on Septentria, patrolling the waterways in search of acanthopods while still occasionally hauling themselves onto land to feed on whatever small prey they can find. The ecological changes that occur during interchange events are numerous and complex, but these will be some of the major developments that occur over the 30 million years or so after the formation of the land bridge and the ecological turnover that follows. However, all of the cumulative hardships that they have endured thus far will be negligible in comparison to what is about to happen. In the next episode, the era that has lasted over 200 million years will finally come to an end with the advent of a mass extinction. Thanks to all the artists on Discord who contributed artwork for this episode, and who saved me an enormous amount of time and effort when making these videos while simultaneously making them look a hell of a lot better in the process. Links to the main server and the Alien Biospheres fan server in the description. And once again, a massive thanks to all the patrons, whose continued support makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.